Today, I want to talk about something different. And as Pastor Cody and I talked about this series, the premise, if you will, was what happens after resurrection? We're going back to Easter and the message that Pastor Don preached then. But what happens after the res- resurrection of Jesus? What do we do now? If we've accepted salvation, what do we do now? And if you know the story uh, in, uh, in the Gospels where it talked about when Jesus was crucified, prior to his resurrection, the followers that he had were known as disciples. They were his students. They were people that walked with him and they learned from him and they gleaned from everything that he did and everything that he said. But when Jesus was resurrected, they were no longer known as disciples. They became apostles. There was a change that happened at the moment Jesus was resurrected. They were disciples once before he, was re- before he died. And after he was resurrected, he now called them or referred to them or looked at them as apostles, the sent ones. And he gave them this com- not command, commission in Matthew 28. He said, now I want you to go out. And I want you to do the same thing that I've done for you. I want you to go and I want you to make disciples. Paul, when he had this encounter with Jesus on the road to Damascus, he was a persecutor of Christians. He was a persecutor of those who followed Jesus. And then he had this this moment where he encountered Jesus and everything changed from Paul or for Paul in that moment. And Paul became an apostle as well. So what do we do after resurrection? What do we do after our salvation? And as believers, I think you can all agree that we often get complacent after we receive our salvation. And not just as believers, but we get complacent in our regular relationships. We get complacent in our marital relationships. You remember when you first uh, found your spouse and y'all were dating? Some of you may call it courting. And all the things that you did prior to getting married and the phone conversations and the text messages. And you sit on the phone and you fall asleep while you're talking on the phone. We go, you hang up. No, you hang up. No, you hang up. Oh, no, you hang up. I love you. Oh, I love you. You remember all that stuff? <laughs> and most times after we get married, that stuff stops. What happens to the dating after we get married? And then don't bring kids into the picture because then it gets really bad. (laughs) Unless you be intentional. Because if you're not intentional, then it will continue to get bad. You know, my wife and I, we made this, this deal, this agreement years ago that we were not going to allow anything or anyone to come in between our relationship. That included our kids. And some people are like, whoa. We pray for kids, and then we allow the kids to come in between our relationship. And there's still a dating. There's still an intentionality. There's still a focus that has to happen in a relationship, even after kids come in the picture. Because there is a day when the kids will go off to school. And start their own lives. And how many relationships have ended once kids go away? Because there was no intentionality. There was no focus. My wife and I, in July this year, we'll be dating 20 years. And in September, we'll be married 19 years. And we still, thank you. I'm just glad she still puts up with me. (laughs) But we still date to this day. We have a day that we spend time and we date. We, we, we're intentional because with my 16-year-old son today, my son just turned 16 today. Happy birthday. <laughs> and my 21st birthday is tomorrow. No, literally, my birthday is tomorrow. <laughs> he was born at 11.59 p.m. On the, on the 14th. And my birthday is the 15th. The doctor was like rushing. She was like, you will not let him have your birthday and your name. It's like, what you mean? <laughs> That's a blessed boy. He gets his, my name and my birthday. <laughs> but we know with this 16-year-old young man and this soon-to-be 18-year-old young girl, 
that they're going to go off one day. And a lot of times when we're, we don't cultivate our relationship, when those kids finally go off, now we're looking at each other crazy. What do we do now? I don't, what, what does this look like now? My wife and I, we started young. We were tw- I was 22. She was 20 when we got married. And at our one-year anniversary, she was nine months pregnant with our daughter. So we jumped into marriage and right into having kids. We had no the honeymoon phase, and most people, they, so a lot of times people wait a year, two years, and all that stuff to get to ha- finally have kids. We jumped right in. We didn't have the time to cultivate, so we had to make sure that we were intentional and that we were focusing on growing our relationship. Salvation isn't the end. Salvation is just the beginning. Your process of growing in Jesus doesn't end once you say yes to him. That's just the start. That's the beginning. And so today we're going to talk about what does it look like to grow in him? We're going to talk about growing in him. In Colossians chapter 2, verse 6, Paul says this to the, uh, to the Colossians. He says, and now just as you trusted God or Christ to save you. Now let's stop right there. There was a level of trust that you had to have that Jesus did exactly what he said he was here for. That there was something happened that he actually lived, that he actually gave his life, and that he was actually resurrected, and now he's seated in heavenly places. You had to trust that you saying yes to him actually gave you salvation. There's a trust there. And what he's telling us here is that the same trust you had in him to save you, he says, trust him too for each day's problems. Your trust in him doesn't just end at salvation. It's actually the start. Because now I have to have trust and faith in him to take care of me and to save me every day. Not just spiritually, but there's some salvation that we need naturally. And there is a trust that we have to have in him. He says in verse 7, let your roots grow down into him and draw up nourishment from him. See that you, look at this, go on growing in the Lord. Salvation is the beginning. We have to be intentional about continuing to grow in the Lord. Intentional is not a word. But intentional is. And become strong and vigorous in the truth you were taught. Let your lives overflow with joy and thanksgiving for all he has done. And then he says, don't let others spoil your faith and joy with their philosophies. Their wrong and shallow answers built on men's thoughts and ideas instead of on what Christ has said. And we see that all in our world today. That men's thoughts and men's ideas are trying to change what we know to be true. And if you don't, if you're not settled in who you are in Christ and your faith in him, he tells you, he says, they will begin to spoil your faith. And not only will they spoil what you believe, but they will begin to rob you of your joy. You can allow people's thoughts that are contrary to the word of God to begin to steal your joy. Don't let them do it. Verse 9 says, for in Christ, there is all of God in a human body. He was 100% God and he was 100% man. Then he said it was complete in him. And in verse 10, it says, so you have everything when you have Christ. You don't lack anything when you have Christ. Everything that you need, you have it being complete in him. And a lot of times we look for completeness in other people. We look for other people to validate us. Do you remember when you had those relationships when you were growing up? And hopefully you don't say that now, but when you were a teenager, you look at at that person that you really, really like and you say, oh, you complete me. You complete me. It's not true. (laughs) You don't find completeness in a person. You find completeness in your father. And the faith that you have in Christ, and Christ was full of God, and Christ is on the inside of us, and so we're full of him, and which makes us complete. He says, And you are filled with God through your union with Christ. He is the highest ruler with authority over every other power. So I tell you today, 
that if we are going to live the kind of life that God has afforded for us to live, we have to keep growing. We have to keep growing, but we have to know what growth is. First thing I want to tell you is that growth is a process. It's a process. Your salvation happened instantly, but the rest of the journey is a process. And I know sometimes we want things to change immediately after we accept Christ. And there are some things that do when you, when you accept Christ. But then there are some things that you don't. Listen, just because you came to Christ, your life and your mind still has thoughts of the past. It still has thoughts and things that you've fed yourself with that were negative and all of those things over and over and over again for years and years and years. There's a process of changing the way you think. There's a process of re- renewing your mind. It doesn't just happen overnight. It's a process. When I came to Jesus, before I came to Jesus, I was a heavy weed smoker. Marijuana for some of (laughs) y'all. Like I I loved smoking weed. Now don't look at me like that because I know all of y'all ain't been saved all y'all life. I know God has saved you for something. You ain't been saved all your life. And some of y'all still doing some stuff. No, let me stop. (laughs) I said in the first service, don't you look at me in that tone of voice. But when I came to Jesus, that thing instantly went away. I didn't have a desire to do it anymore. But can I tell you, there were some other things that didn't go away instantly. It was a process. I had, to, I had to discipline myself. I had to, as he says, point to his mind. I had to change my mind. I had to be renewed by my mind. And as I was being renewed by my mind, then it began to transform me on the outside. There's a process for some things. Some things happen instantly, but there's a process for others. Even the Bible tells us in Proverbs t- chapter 24 that a righteous man falls seven times, but he gets back up. You may be on the third and fourth and fifth time of falling, but God's expectation is not that you would fall, that you wouldn't fall, but God's expectation is that you would get back up. He knows you're going to fall. He knows that you're going to fail because if he didn't know, then he wouldn't have sent Jesus. The fact that he sent Jesus is encouragement enough to know that I am going to fall, but there is someone who's able to present me faultless before the King of kings and the Lord of lords. When I know I'm not faultless, he's able to present me faultless back to the Father. Say it's a process. Philippians chapter 3, Paul tells us this. He says, not that I've already obtained all this, Or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I don't consider myself yet to have taken a hold of it, but one thing I do, watch this. He says, I forget what is behind. Now we have a past. Every single one of you has a past. It doesn't matter how long you've been in Jesus, you got a past. And you have some things that you don't want other people to know about. So there's some things that you just want to keep between you and Jesus. That's why I cannot and refuse to judge anyone for what they get caught doing publicly, for what Jesus didn't judge me for, for doing privately. You may not have caught me in some of the things that I've done or seen me in some of the things, but the grace that he showed me for the things that didn't come out, how can I judge you for the things that did? He says, I press on toward the goal for the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Say, it's a process. You can come to church every week. You can come once a month. You can come three times a month or twice a month. You can can come on Christmas and Mother's Day and Easter only. But can I tell you, that's not going to completely change you. You might be thinking like, if I just keep going to church and just keep going to church, I'm going to change. There is some validity to that. But you just showing up to church isn't going to completely change you. But guess what? It's a part of the process. 
You serving, you may have served for months and months. Maybe you're not serving yet, and you may think that if I just jump in to serve, that's going to change me. Can I tell you, it's not going to completely change you. It's part of the process. You can go to growth track all four weeks, be on time, show up, get your pen and pad and write, and got notes, everything. But can I tell you, that's not going to completely change you. That's not going to keep you from thinking those thoughts of going back to the person that you used to be. But it's just part of the process. You can get in a small group, be a part of a small group. We want you to. We want you to get into a small group. It's not going to change you, though. So I don't want you to walk into it having that expectation. But can I tell you, it's part of the process. We have to make daily deposits in order to grow in Christ. It takes intentionality. It takes intentionality. It takes focus. It takes dedication. And there's one other thing that it takes. It takes discipline. I wrote this in my notes, and you can write it down. Growing requires, I didn't put it up there, growing requires discipline. And discipline doesn't happen instantly, but the choice to be disciplined does. Let me say that for you again. Growing requires a level of discipline. And discipline does not happen in a moment, but the choice to be disciplined does. Discipline, it's going to take a process. It's going to take you doing something intentional. It's going to take you being focused. It's going to take you actually doing something and showing up and serving and giving and doing all of those things and and forgetting who you were and striving to be someone, someone better. It's a part of the process. You know, there's some mountains that are in your life that are going to require more than just your faith. And I know we like to, to, to quote the scripture that I can speak to a mountain and tell that mountain to move. If I have faith the size of a mustard seed, that thing is going to jump in the sea. And I want you to know that that is true. You've got to speak to the mountain and you've got to have the faith to, to believe that that mountain is going to move. But can I tell you, some mountains are going to require some discipline as well. It's going to require more than just your faith. And I know that we like to to look at our bodies sometimes and we want to speak to to the mountain of of, of fat. In Jesus' name. I shunned that boko. I release. (laughs) Be free. (laughs) That fat ain't going nowhere. You can try all you want. You can speak in tongues. You can fast. The fasting actually might help (laughs) now that we say that. (laughs) You see? (laughs) There's some mountains that you can speak to and see them move, but there's also some mountains that you just got to climb up. You just got to have the courage and the boldness and the strength to just climb up the mountain and go over the mountain. I spoke to you and you didn't move, but you're not going to prevent me from getting all that God has for me. I'm going to go over you. If I can't go around you, if I can't go through you, I'm going to climb up over you. Say it's part of the process. Even Paul, when he was faced with that thorn in his flesh, He's seen God do some amazing things in his life. He's seen God free other people. He's seen God heal other people. And then he asked God, remove this thing from me. And God said, no. What? You've done all of this stuff for other people, and I've seen you. I've laid hands on people and watched them recover. I've laid hands on people and seen healing come. I've done all of these things. God, what do you mean? He says, my grace is sufficient for you. Some mountains, you just got to get grace. Can I tell you that God's not putting putting it on you, but he'll give you the grace to get through it. Even David, he said, listen, I know that there is a point in my life that I'm going to have to go through this valley. He says, so when I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I don't fear evil because I know my God is with me. His rod and his staff, they come for me. Listen, I know we don't like the valley, but there is a time that we've got to go through it. But you have to know that God is with you in the midst of it. It's just part of the process, baby. It's just part of the process. God has an expectation of us 
to continue to grow, to continue to mature. And that doesn't happen overnight. And God doesn't have an expectation of it to happen overnight. He knows that it's a process. Look at what he says in 1 Peter 2, uh, chapter 2. He says, like newborn babies crave pure spiritual milk so that by it you may grow up in your salvation. Listen, there is a time where you've got to just be on milk. But then there's a time where you got to get some meat too. Try giving your baby, your six-month-old baby, a, a 12-ounce ribeye. It don't matter if it's, it, it, don't make it well done because that's not steak. That's, that's just, I'm sorry for those of y'all that like well done steak. <laughs> Medium. And if you eat steak rare, ugh, that's just nasty. <laughs> ugh. <laughs> But try giving, that's what I'm talking about. <laughs> She's like, I want steak. Mama, no. Try giving a baby steak. There is a process and there is a time for it. They've got to be on milk. But then there is a certain point in your life where milk doesn't help you anymore. It doesn't sustain you anymore. Now I've got to get something a little bit more. And can I tell you, when you come here, I'm, you may not get meat all the time. There may be some times that we'll throw some meat in there, but our responsibility is to make sure that we've got milk for those that are coming, who've never been here before, who doesn't know what sanctification is, who doesn't know what it means to be holy, who doesn't know what it means to live like Christ. They don't know. So meat is not going to help them. It's going to hurt them. So we've got to give them some milk. But if the meat is going to come, that's going to take you studying to show yourself approved unto God. A workman that need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. It's going to take you actually putting some intentionality in your growth. It's going to take you serving. It's going to take you jumping into a small group. It's going to take you just like the young adults and rooted after services when they go back and, hey, praise God, when they go back and they're diving into the word and they're wanting, let's, let's look at what, 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 how can we get our roots deep in him? As it says in Colossians 2, because that's where the growth is going to happen. So don't come here and leave the church and say, well, I'm leaving because I'm not getting fed. Well, what are you doing? Because our responsibility is to make sure that those who are coming who don't know Jesus, that they hear a word that helps them to make the connection with him. Grow at your own pace. You've got to grow at your own pace and stop making people feel bad when their growth doesn't look like yours. Don't diminish other people's growth because they're not growing as quickly or as fast as you. It's okay if it takes a little bit longer for them to understand and to grow in it. Just grow at your pace and don't let anybody make you feel bad for growing at your pace. Grow at your pace. Point number two, growth requires stewardship and stewardship is a requirement from God. God requires us to be good stewards over that which he has given us. You know, my, my wife saw these flowers in H-E-B. I'm going to move really fast. She saw these flowers right here. Aren't they pretty? I ain't buying for. My daughter did. Just, let me tell the story. <laughs> she saw these flowers in H-E-B and she was like, oh my God, those are so pretty. And then my daughter and my son, they went back and they bought her the flowers. And that was probably about three weeks ago. Last night, I took another picture. I know she wanted the flowers to look like they looked when we first got them. But can I tell you, my wife doesn't have a green thumb, and I got permission to say this, so she's not going to beat me up after the service, okay? Okay. But in order for those flowers to stay like they looked in the first picture, there was some intentionality that my wife had to put in place to make sure that those flowers stayed alive. I know your marriage looked really, really beautiful when you first walked down the aisle. But can I tell you, if you're not intentional in watering that thing and growing that thing, sometimes you got to take it out of one pot and put it in another pot. 
because that smaller pot is it's, it's a little too small and it's actually stunting the growth of that thing. So you got to put it in another pot that's a little bit bigger so that it can continue to grow some more. We've got to change our pots. We got to continue to water. We've got to be intentional because if you don't, what you don't steward and what you don't manage will die. If you don't steward your marriage, it's going to die. If you don't steward your finances, it's going to die. If you don't steward your mental health and your joy and your peace, if you don't steward those things, you're going to lose it. If you don't steward your faith, it's not going to be as strong as you would like for it to be. What you don't manage, what you don't steward, you will lose. Jesus said it this way in Matthew chapter 25. He says, again, the kingdom of heaven can be illustrated by the story of a man going on a long trip. He called together his servants and entrusted his money to them while he was gone. He gave five bags of silver to one, two bags of silver to another, and one bag of silver to the last, dividing it in proportion to, look at this, their abilities. Not to, what, not to his abilities or what he felt like they should be able to do, he already knew what their abilities were, so he gave them what he felt like they could manage, what he felt like that they could steward. A lot of times we feel like God gives us something and we say, God, this is too much. No, God gave it to you because he knew that you had the ability to steward it. Now, if you manage it and you steward it, or if you don't, that is up to you. It's not God's decision. It's up to you. And I know when we look at this, this parable of the talents, we always think about money, but it's not about money. It's about stewardship. How are you stewarding your body? How are you stewarding that which God has given you? And I said it last week and I'm going to say it again. I'm not trying to shame you into to going and working out and going to the gym, although we do. But listen, praying at it, it's not going to go nowhere. How are you stewarding that which God has given you? God gave you peace in your mind. How are you stewarding it? God gave you freedom. He gave you, he gave you deliverance. He got you out of prison for some people. How are you stewarding it? How are you showing and proving that you are grateful for what he has given you? If you know the story, when he gave to the five, he went and invested. When he gave the one the three, he went and invested it. When he gave the person the one, he went and dug a hole. Look what happens in verse 19. It says, after a long time, that master returned from his trip and called them to give an account of how they had used what he had given them. There is a time that you're going to stand before God and you're going to have to give account for how you stewarded that which he has given you. I remember one time, my wife and I, uh, this was when we were living in Charlotte, it was before we moved here. And we had this huge argument. And I can probably count on one hand how many times we've actually had like a blowout argument and different stuff like that. You always have disagreements, but like a blowout argument. And this one time we had this argument and I was yelling like, like to the top of my lungs. And I walked out of the house and I slammed the door and I went and got in the car and I said, God, I can't take this. And he said, why are you talking to my daughter like that? I was like, boom. You talk about being a steward over that which he has given you? Is that how you're going to steward what I gave you? Why are you talking to my daughter like that? I never raised my voice at her again because I revere God too much. And I want to show him that I'm grateful for this gift, this beautiful wife that he has given me. How are you stewarding that which God has given you? Verse 20, the servant to whom he had entrusted the five bags of silver came forward with five more and said, Master, you gave me five bags of silver to invest and I've earned five more. The master was full of praise. Well done, my good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in handling this small amount. So now I will give you many more responsibilities. Let's celebrate together. We are working for our well done. And well done is only good for faithful servants, not steaks. You see what I did there? Okay. You got it? Okay. So make sure y'all following along, paying attention. Verse 29. He says, to those who use well, look at this, what they are given. To those that steward what God has given you well. It doesn't have to be a million dollars. Steward that $100 you got. And if you can steward that $100 you got, God will make sure that you get 1000 
And if you can take care of that 1,000 that he's giving you, then you're going to show and prove that he can trust you with 10,000. And the more that you steward what he's giving you, it gives him the ability. It says even more will be given and they'll have an abundance. But if you don't steward what you're given, even what you have, you're going to lose it. God requires stewardship. And you've got salvation. You're being discipled. How are you using that which you have been given? This new life that God has given you, how are you stewarding it? Are you helping others? Are you telling other people about Jesus? How are you stewarding and being faithful over what you're giving? Or are you like that one, the, the servant that he gave one to? He said, you're a lazy person. Are you being faithful or are we being lazy? Growth requires stewardship. And then point number three, growth happens through pain. And I know we don't like this part, but can I tell you that hard times help us to grow? Hard times, we want everything to be good, but hard times help us grow. I would not have known that God was a provider unless I had a need. I can say it till I'm blue in the face, God's a provider, but I didn't know that he could provide until I had a need that he had to provide for. I wouldn't have known that God was a healer unless he healed me or I seen him do it in, some, in the life of someone else. Hard times help us to grow. And it tells us in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 7, to endure hard times as discipline. God is treating you as children for what children are not disciplined by their father. God's not putting a hardship on you, but he's allowing us to endure it as discipline because it's training. You know, my son, uh, my 16-year-old son, he had these shoes that he wanted to sell, and he decided to put these shoes on eBay without having a conversation with mom and I, but he puts these shoes on eBay, and he's like, man... I'm really going, I'm going to get this money. I'm about to get this bag. Like whatever y'all say nowadays, kids. Stacks, racks on racks, whatever. And he put this ad up. Somebody's laughing in the back really loud, Tracy. <laughs> I know her voice, so I know it was her. <laughs> and he put this ad out there because he wanted to use the ad because it was going to help him get more views. He didn't know that the ad was going to charge him. And so when the shoes came back, for whatever reason, they came back. The ad fee was still there. And he's like, well, dad, I got the shoes back, but you paid for the ad. People still saw it. So you paid for that. So now his account is in the negative because they snatched the money out. And so he tripping. He like, I don't have no money no more. And I said, son, that's your fault. Because if you had just come to daddy, I could have told you, don't put the ad on there. I could have told you and showed you how to do it the right way. But now you have to endure hardship because of the choice that you made. I'm not putting this on you. You put this on yourself. And so now you're going to learn that not to do that again. How many things in our lives, if we had just come to God and asked him and got direction for him and got wisdom from him, that we wouldn't have, it wouldn't have ended in something bad. If we just took James 1 and 5, that if you lack wisdom, come to him and ask him and he gives it to you and don't make you feel bad about it. That relationship that you're in, maybe it wouldn't be where it was if you just asked God. He's like, I wanted to help you. But your flesh ruled in that moment. Uh-oh. There's some things that we won't endure in our lives if we just come to the Father. But then there are some things and some hard times that help us to learn if we choose to learn from it. Paul says in, in Romans chapter 8 that all things work together for the good of those who are called according. See, all means all. Not just some things, not just the good things, not just the things you want everybody to know about, not just the things that you want to hide and don't want anybody to know about. Listen, all things work together for our good if we love him and are called according to his plan. Can I tell you that your pain, look at this, has a purpose. And don't feel like it, but your pain has a purpose. In Romans chapter five, it tells us that the purpose of it is to develop endurance. 
The purpose of hardship is to develop and build character. It's to develop and strengthen our our confident hope of our salvation. Your pain, it has a purpose. But Hebrews 12, 11 says that no discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Discipline hurts. And I know you remember when you were growing up and your parents used to say, this is going to hurt me more than it hurts you. I feel like God should have struck him down at that time because, like, that was you lying through your teeth because this thing hurt for real, for real. I said, I'll never say that to my kids. And then I had kids and I said, this is going to hurt me more than, <laughs> more than it hurts you. <laughs> I talked to somebody afterwards. He said, my dad didn't say that. He said, no, this is going to hurt you. It ain't going to hurt me at all. <laughs> But no discipline is pleasant in the moment. It hurts. But if you allow it, look at what it says. It says later on, it produces a harvest of righteousness. It produces peace to those who have been trained by it. What that tells me there is that growth, point number four, is a choice. You can choose to be trained by the hardship or you can choose to blame everybody else for the things that you're going through. You can choose to point the finger at everybody else and say, I am where I am right now because it was your fault. Or you can be trained by the hardship and the things that you are doing, you're enduring. One of the most immature statements that a believer could ever make, that a son and daughter of God could ever make, is this is just who I am. And a lot of us say that. It's just who I am. You either like it or you love it. You deal with it or you don't. (laughs) Boo-boo. However y'all doing, y'all turn your head to the side like that. She said, okay, you're doing too much. It's because some of y'all wouldn't be like, uh. I was, that was a little too good. (laughs) Let me reel it back on here. Galatians chapter 2 tells us that it's not about you being selfish. It's not about this is just who I am. I have been crucified with Christ. And I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. That's a person that says, I'm making a decision to grow. I'm not just going to be who I was, but I'm growing to be someone better. It doesn't mean that it's going to happen overnight. Now, before, I might have cussed you out right on the spot. But now it takes me a couple days before I actually, or maybe I may just let that one slide. But I'm growing. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. And the life that I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. We got to get rid of those childish ways of thinking. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians, when I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. But when I became a man, I put the ways of childhood behind me. One thing that a child always says, so it's like the first word they ever say, it's not dad, dad, it's not mama, it's mine. Selfish from our inception. And then we move on from selfishness to I can do it by myself. You remember when your kid was like two or three years old and they didn't want you to feed them anymore. They didn't want you to hold the bottle anymore. They didn't want you to do things. As, I, Mom, I can do it by myself. Daddy, I can do it by I want to do it by myself. Some of us still have that mentality in our relationship with God. Daddy, I want to do it by myself. But I want you to be free from that thing. I want you to be free from that trauma. I want you to be free, but I can do it by myself. I want you to be healed from that. I want to heal that wound that you've been struggling with and suffering with for for a very long time. Daddy, I can do it by myself. I don't need your help. I can do it by myself. We've got to get to a point where we put away childish things, childish ways of thinking but it's your choice. It's not God's choice 
It's your choice. And when you make growth your choice, as Pastor Don said in the beginning of the year, this is going to be the year that we see fruit. When you make growth your choice, you will see and bear fruit in your lives. In Psalm chapter 92, but the godly will flourish like palm trees and grow strong like the cedars of Lebanon. For they are transplanted to the Lord's own house. They flourish in the courts of our God. Look at this. Even in old age, they will still produce fruit. You can still produce fruit today. No matter how long you've been in Christ, you can still produce fruit today. The day you stop growing, Pastor Joel says, is the day you start dying. Keep growing. That's what God is looking to us for, to continue to grow, to just get better every single day. Not to be perfect, but to just get better. 